Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to Answer Lab Day 2 Conversations Manila. My name is Lara Akuin. I'm faculty at De La Salle College of St. Benilde. Thank you very much for coming and taking time to attend today's program. And a big, big thanks to the speakers uh, for their generosity in giving their time today to share their practices and projects with everyone. Um, I'd now like to introduce the Dean of the School of Design and Arts, De La Salle College of St. Benilde, the co-organizer for Answer Lab, architect Doty Acela Domingo. Architect Doty Acela Domingo is a licensed architect and environmental planner, completing her architectural degree from UP Diliman and her MBA in Ateneo Graduate School of Business. She had years of corporate practice in different real estate companies, such as Ayala Land, Inc., Lanco Pacific, and Finma Properties. Her first teaching stint was in Benilde way back in 2010 as part of the pioneering pool of the architecture faculty. Also in 2010, she started her own private architectural practice, designing and constructing residential and institutional projects. In 2013, she was tapped to be part of the consultancy group that initiated the physical master planning strategies of Benilde. In 2015, she was asked to serve as OIC Associate Dean for SDA Environmental Studies Cluster. She has been serving as the Dean of the School of Design and Arts of Benilde, Manila since 2016. Please join me in welcoming architect Doty Acela Domingo. Good morning, everyone, and greetings from Manila. Welcome to day two of Answer Lab Conversations. It is a privilege to be participating in these dialogues with such esteemed resource speakers sharing their expertise and valuable insights in the arts and culture scene during this critical time of the pandemic. Please allow me to share our status in the academia. I'm currently the Dean of the De La Salle College of St. Benilde School of Design and Arts in Manila. When Benilde opened its School of Design and Arts, there were many doubts and obstacles. Our arts management program is actually our very first offering three decades ago. With this one program, arts management back in 1989, we started with only five students. And now more than 30 years after, we have grown and expanded our offerings to 13 degree programs with over 4,700 students. School of Design and Arts is now home to half of the student population of Benilde. Even for this new school year 2021 to 2022, we were surprised to have a 12% increase in enrollment despite the major challenges of the pandemic. This is a feat. This is a testament that our creative industries, despite the limitations of the pandemic, is still growing and daring to evolve with the times. So it is in this line of innovation and expansion that I would like to encourage our arts managers to continue widening your perspectives. Among the many artists and designers in the different fields, you are actually an extraordinary block, as you have the artist's sensibilities and at the same time equipped with managerial skills. I myself, an architect by profession, had to get an MBA just so I can combine both the creative and management skills. This combination is critical right now, as we are daring to reposition our creative industries as major contributors to economic development during this time of pandemic. In our country right now, we have bills proposed in the House of Congress and in the Senate on the Philippine Creative Industries Development Act, enumerating nine main domains or fields in audiovisual arts, in digital and creative services, in environmental design, in publishing, in performing arts, in visual arts, in cultural and traditional arts, in cultural site and heritage management, and other emerging fields. And I firmly believe that you, our arts managers, can and will play critical roles in these multiple domains, both in sectoral and overall development. Again, very few of our current practitioners are equipped with business management and entrepreneurial aptitudes. And this is where our arts managers can come in with your unique value propositions and skill sets. So I encourage you to widen your scopes, endeavor to learn the different sectors, and make your unique contributions as art managers. I'm sure today will be a day of much learning and much inspiration. So let's join in, listen, and actively participate. Have a blessed day to everyone. Thank you and maraming salamat po. Thank you, Dean Domingo. And um, to give us a better sense of the goals and ideas behind the making of ANSWER, I'd 
I'd like to introduce the Deputy Chairman and Provost of La Salle College of the Arts Singapore, the co-organizer for today's program and answer founder, Dr. Venka Purusotaman. Dr. Venka Purusotaman is Deputy President and Provost at La Salle College of the Arts Singapore and founder of the Asia Pacific Network for an award-winning art writer with a distinguished career in the arts and creative industries in Singapore. He speaks internationally on transformative art and design education and works to enable the development of cultural leaders in Southeast Asia. He is widely published and is currently editor of Issue, an annual international peer-reviewed art journal. Benka holds a PhD in cultural policy and Asian cultural studies from the University of Melbourne. He is a member of the Association Internationale de Critique d'Art in France, Singapore, and Fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts in the UK. He is University Fellow at Masashino Art University in Japan and was recently inducted into the International Cultural Relations Research Alliance of the Institute for Auslan Bibit Singhongen in Germany. Please, let's all welcome Dr. Venka Purusotaman. Thank you, Paula, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, Dean Dotti Asala Domingo. Uh, Dean of School of Design and Arts, the La Salle College of St. Benil. Uh, good morning to Alan and colleagues, and Audrey and colleagues from our respective arts management programs in St. Benil and La Salle. I warmly welcome all participants, presenters, and students to the ANSA Lab uh, 03 Manila. The coordinators requested I speak to the purpose of ANSA. ANSA, or the Asia Pacific Network for Cultural uh, Education and Research, was founded to bring about a timely conversation between artists, cultural workers, policymakers, educators, uh, to, to really, you know, uh, uh, particularly provide ways to share issues and concerns in Asia across the world. Through informal discussions, formal presentations, tactical interventions, and creative partnerships, ANSA seeks to think through and give voice to issues such as, first, what is the relationship between public and cultural policy discourse in Asia and artists and their communities? We are interested as to how they intersect and in what kinds of issues that emerge from these intersections in the face of highly technologized and connected communities. How is education in sectors such as arts management responding to these new scenarios? Is the currency of education still located in the late 20th century discourse? Secondly, that any notion of the cultural and creative sector is primarily framed within notions of neocolonialism, modernity, and commerce. What, if any, new frameworks relating to cultural preservation and representation are emerging in places such as the Philippines, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, or Indonesia, for example? Third, how can we enable conversations and ground up initiatives within Asia without the burden of hierarchy and previously established frameworks and knowledge. Fourth, how can we enable artists to be empowered to explore concerns in their respective fields? What kinds of new meanings are being produced and how are they being circulated? Last but not least, how has the pandemic availed us opportunities to reconstruct institutionalized practices? These critical questions inform the ecology of an artist in the 21st century and the carapace of contemporary discourse in arts management, particularly in Asia. In preparing my opening uh, address uh, this morning, I returned back to my closing remarks at the last ANSA conference held in the thick of the pandemic in September, 2020. More than 300 uh, participants from 29 different countries attended and were highly engaged in multiple parallel sessions. We entered this world of conferencing digitally with lots of trepidation. But the deeply probing and thoughtful questions made our speakers pay attention and address questions more directly. It also brought about a digital fellowship that added to the embodied fellowship that ANSA events are known for. But the conversations in the midst of the pandemic focused around ideas that our own cultural policies may not be fit for purpose as they speak to more economic ends and to, to capital generating activities rather than a post pandemic world. Questions around artists and their communities being caught off guard emerge that, that the world may not have progressed or become more enlightened over the years. As such, 
arts and cultural workers continue to uh, assemble or piece together a cultural and creative economy that, that may not be fit for purpose or befit a post-pandemic world. And the key question that emerged in the, in the conference was, is artist education still the exclusive purview of educational institutions? Or is it increasingly finding new spaces and new opportunities built around collectivism and collectivist center sensibilities, providing a new and informed pedagogical structures? The final point is, is what brings us to this wonderful Manila lab. The virus is around us, within us, amongst us. It is one of us. Like all new visitors entering a collective social space, it can be a friend or foe. The pandemic has revealed, at least to me, that we all may be fighting very different battles at cross purposes, but in actual fact, we have more in common. We must do away with ignorance to draw from art, art critic Mariam Pastorosa, for we must embrace rightly or wrongly with things that go viral in social media so readily, but have less understanding when things are viral in our social spaces. There's much to do, much to study. This Manila lab, which has a wonderful closed door session yesterday, revealed the importance of education to bridge ground realities, the urgent need to refine and redefine creative disciplines and re-engage and rejuvenate our communities and our friends. It's, start, it's time to start to look at our life, at our life and our educational processes with new lenses. With that, I welcome all of you to Answer Lab 03 Manila. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Purusvataman. Um, and now, uh, looking forward to extending um, that conversation from yesterday, um, I would like to introduce uh, the moderator for our first session, Sandra Palomarquan. Sandra Palomarquan currently lives and works as artist, researcher, and consultant in Dumaguete City, Negros Island, Philippines. She was the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Manila from 2012 to 2015. She currently lectures at the Arts Management Program of the De La Salle College of St. Peniel, Manila, and at the Fine Arts Program of Foundation University in Dumaguete City. She studied Fine Arts, BFA, at the University of the Philippines de Liman, and Multimedia, MFA, at the École Nationale Supérieure de Beaux-Arts de Paris. Please join me in welcoming Sandra Palomarquan. Thank you, Paula, for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to the first part of our conversation entitled Art, Culture, COVID, Pandemic Survival Story. We have a full session this morning up to one o'clock with at least six uh, speakers or six presenters. The first part will be about presenters based in the Philippines. And the second part will have presenters from Malaysia, Thailand, and Japan. A little bit about our topic. In the past year and a half, artists and arts organizations have had to find ways to engage meaningfully with their audiences in the face of a never ending lockdown. Six of these artists led run spaces and platforms share their creative strategies with us today on how to survive and what is necessary to stay alive and relevant to their communities. Let's hear it first from uh, Mark Salvato. Hello, hi. Hi, Mark. Can we Manila. find out from what part of Manila are you calling us or zooming us with? From what part of Manila? In Cubao, in Quezon City. We're locked okay. down since last year. <laughs> Lockdown since last year, up to today. Oh, dear. <laughs> wow. Allow me to just uh, say a few words about you. Um, I know that you have been working and living in Manila for the longest time since you were born. No? You studied advertising uh, arts at the University of Santa Tomas. Uh, Mark's works have been presented in numerous international exhibitions. Just too long to tell now, but um, just to mention perhaps uh, the International Studio Curatorial Program he was part of in New York. Uh, he was also part of the Sharjah Biennale in 2019. Uh, the Sun Shower Art in Southeast Asia 
from the 1980s to now was an exhibit at the Mori Art Museum uh, in, in 2017. He is also a recipient of the 13 Artists Award of the Cultural Center of the Philippines in 2012 and the Ateneo Art Award in 2010. Interestingly, in 2006, he had already co-founded Filipina Street Plan. It's a community of street artists based in Manila. And in 2012, he co-founded 98B Collab Buratory, a multidisciplinary site for creative sharing, discussion, and collaboration. Then in 2016, he definitely is not finished with find, finding, founding, establishing uh, these uh, platforms. Load Nadito, Lo Nadi, with Mayumi Hirano, uh, an artistic and research project based in Manila. Okay. Mark, I leave you to talk about Load Nadito and to tell us how that continues on under mm -hmm. this uh, situation. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you for the invitation to be part of the no, of this answer session. Thank you again to CSB and LaSalle Singapore for this organizing this session. And as uh, Sandra told you about, I'm, I'm working a lot with initiatives and uh, different platforms since 2006. Because uh, I think the idea of collectivity is also, and collaboration is uh, kind of natural in a way with uh, many of the artists here in the Philippines that work together and the idea of uh, uh, moving forward together. So, but for now, I will talk about the Loda Dito because it's a somewhat new initiative since 2016. Yeah, so. Loda Dito is uh, an artistic and research project based in Manila, developed as a homemade culture currently located in Cuba, where I am now. So uh, it uses uh, any possible space as a site for knowledge sharing, inquiry, and discussion. So Loda Dito is a local top-up system for cell phone credit. It's a very vernacular system on how you can get a load everywhere you can. I mean, uh, if you have a, if you run out of your load in your cell phone or data, you can get a load anywhere. So we copied this model, maybe as a possible way to present different projects. So the initiative makes projects in different locations. So it's the same with the idea of this load Dito, as long as you see the sign of this placard load Dito we build new energies to have load. So we are trying to discuss how a space can be without a really permanent space because having a space, like for example, art initiative is also a burden in a way. It's also a commitment. And also it talks about territory also, so, or territorial uh, in a context of, uh, of creating a space. So by co-organizing, co-organizing wide range of programs, Lodanito hopes to critically address the question of participation and collaboration in relation to the practice of contemporary art. So this one is, uh, as you see, different kinds of, of uh, signages that you can see in almost every corner in the Philippines that has some kind of uh, a signal that you can get a load here. So load na dito copied that idea in how we can maybe make projects in small to big uh, energies. We, we call it energies, not really program because it's more kind of like circulated. So we are interested with the idea of circulation amongst our participants. We don't also call as much as collaborators, but more as participants, as artists, as, as we, we also work with uh, a lot of students, but mostly artists. So since 2016, we have been developing various ways of engagements. So as facilitators and also as participants, as I mentioned uh, earlier. So I just want 
you want you to you to you to show also a loose uh, we don't also call it membership but participants and the idea of participation also is 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 uh, come and go but we believe that each of us also have their own uh, their own capacity to to be involved so uh, right now in the session, uh, Marian Barrio is here and Jerome Soriano, and maybe they can share later in the Q and A, or if we have some time to to talk to them. So uh, as I've said, we are facilitators and also as participants. So we made different projects like intimate talks, discussions, symposiums public performances and a one day exhibit and publication and also game. So uh, the core idea of what we do is to create social space and to share knowledge, not really about production or exhibition. Exhibition is just one part of our energies in a way but uh, we want to create this kind of like shared energies to our uh, participants. So as we, Lona Dito, as the organizers or facilitators are participating too. So we are not only organizing, but we are also learning or co-learning with, with others. So these are some of the projects that we've done. So we. We collaborated with uh, like Viva XCon, with uh, uh, different spaces. So because, uh, as I mentioned, creating a space is uh, a commitment, but uh, creating co-projects with other spaces may be a new way to develop projects that is more maybe productive and meaningful, not building a new one, something like that. So this is like a, some of the projects and this is the last project that we did in a physical space in 2020 in the in the art fair and it's interesting it's in an art fair format but we still use as a space to hang out so and uh, we always believe the idea of hanging out as a way by not maybe have a specific agenda as an idea of tambay in the philippine context but it creates energy between the people who are involved. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, so in, that was in February, but March, uh, everything was shut down. So we have to stop and we have to see or reflect back and recalibrate our ways of working with others and critical production and presentation of contemporary art. So we started to ask questions and continue the discussion because the discussion is very important on how we develop our program. So we use the internet platform to, to ask artists what they are doing now. Uh, I mean, this was towards the first few months of the lockdown. So we created this series of question for questions for different artists who are uh, living in the Philippines, in different parts of the, the, the Philippines, and just um, like updating or like what you call this, it's like uh, we want to update each other on what they're doing now. So what they have been doing in the past few weeks of lockdown during April, May last year. So it becomes an intimate but productive discussion because we kind of share, even though we are not physically connected. And it becomes an archive of the feelings and also the, the sentiments and the anger of the artist. And then we ask them also to share image of what they feel on that uh, particular moment. And this one is becoming, it, it becomes like a yeah, archive of that as a, as I've mentioned, it becomes the energy that can be accessed because the, the production itself of the work is not the making, but the conversation that we maybe created. 
So we would like to share to you. So this is just one of the first few I know. Uh, projects that we thought of just reflecting, thinking what is not thinking of making or producing, but more on to going back to yourself or reflecting to your surroundings. And uh, we want to, with this question, we start to I know, ask question too. We have to continue this discussion. What to produce? What do we need to produce? We should have or we need maybe alternative methods, tools, and practice, maybe to grow together and maybe to fail together. So we would like to share to you one project of Lo Dalito over the past year, adapting to the situation of isolation, force restriction, and slow movements. So a delicate, careful process of connection through critical and productive conversation. So you're seeing Flex is a listening and talking game. So participants sit in a circle around the empty bottle. In the center, there is no moderator. The game proceeds by spinning the bottle. The person pointed by the bottle picks out the word from the deck of flex cards. Or the previous person talk and freely speaks about what comes to her or her mind. So although the content of the talk does not have to be related to what the previous person has said, the participants need to always keep their ears open to what others say because they never know when their turn will come. So this is the um, idea of flex. It's really hard to explain, but it's because it's a game, you need to experience and to know, to understand what is the dynamics of this game. But basically it's a talking game where in the, everyone is a participant. So the we thought of this game to adapt to the situations we use, the online platform, but it becomes very interesting because the, this one creates the idea of connectedness, even though you are kind of isolated from each other. So this becomes a tool for us to, to what you call this, to have a conversation. And, uh, this becomes also an idea how we can create maybe a project, even though we are separated from each other. So this flex uh, as connected by words instead of content. We have right now collected almost 200 words, uh, 500 words since the beginning of the flex in the 2019. So by transferring the online space to our surprise, it turned out to be an effective platform of sharing so much more than we had expected. First of all, it became an opportunity for the participants who had been isolated in their homes to reflect and voice out their daily observations, feelings, and thoughts while unpacking the meanings of familiar words. So uh, the participants were also able to exchange words with others without the responsibility of making direct response. So by making this uh, no, no specific agenda, the process of the game becomes the, the consolidation method of how we can form one, uh, one project. For this one, they, they come up with an exhibition. So as facilitator, we don't impose anything, but for the participants, they thought of maybe let's do an exhibition. And uh, it, uh, as we are uh, thinking of exhibition making, usually it's predetermined team or you already have a concept, like for example, a curator or a main person who is organizing it. But this one, everyone is involved as part of making the show. So we are also presenting the backside or the hidden side of the production and also the, the, the process itself. So the process becomes also shown in the, in the exhibition space as, because usually the, as an, as a, an idea of management is also usually hidden. In the exhibition space, it's already hidden in the back walls, but uh, here we want to produce or show the, the process at the same time, it's the presentation and production. So this was done in different locations. So this one, we collaborated with the Japanese artists 
but also we also co collaborated with the Filipino artists who yeah, we didn't plan it, but because of the discussion, it created this, oh, let's invite also some Filipino artists. And this is another project made by Flex, by Filipino artists who we kind of gathered to do the same, the same uh, format of the game. And uh, it presented different, uh, based from the previous words collected, we gathered it to be part of the, the next group. So it's like a changing and becoming a bigger collection of words. And these words not necessarily respond to what they are thinking, but because each word has different meanings and it's always changing and uh, as an idea of flexing. So the participants flex each other's meanings also. So uh, based from these words, it becomes the prompt for the artist to develop individual works. But what is important for us is we develop together the, the exhibition because usually artists only think about production or making the work individually, but exhibition making usually is given as a task to curators or managers. But here, everything is part of, you know, uh, part of the whole, uh, whole process of making an exhibition. So we are interested also in the exhibition making and also, of course, the presentation of exhibition. So this is the outcome. And uh, this is interesting because as I've said, we are always interested in conversation. So every time we have this exhibition and presentation, we always have to talk and discuss things. And we also invite other people who are not part of the process. So for this, we invited, it's an open call, so anyone can be part of. So we also use the Flex as a tool. So one of the participants who is from Cavite invited us to use the Flex in his community in Cavite, which are farmers. And it becomes very good format for them to open up because it's words and some of the words also are in Filipino. So for them, it's a very uh, uh, refreshing to, take, to talk without any specific agenda, but to talk about, for example, a word is mother. So can, they can talk about mother, they can talk about land. So this idea of flexing becomes a tool for us to really see other perspective of how we can maybe develop uh, togetherness and also create some kind of like collectivity. So from this game, we are looking for this idea of uh, circulation. So even though we are not there, anyone can play this flex as a form of, yeah, as a form of gathering, as a form of collectivity and sh share, sharing the knowledge of each other. So, yeah, I think this is my, our presentation. Thank you, Mark. And discuss it later. Thank you. What I took from that strategy to survive was uh, your um, of flex, huh? facilitating the circulation of uh, energy uh, through game mm -hmm. without gamifying it on the digital uh, network uh, and play as methods. Wonderful. Yes. I invite the audience to type any of their questions that they may have, which we will address at the end of uh, all the presentations. Now let's move on to our next presenter, Ms. Ali Garibay. Ali, hello. Hey. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. How are you and where are you calling Zooming us from? Hello, I'm... I'm good. I'm in Amado. I'm talking from Amadeo, Cavite. And yeah, I'll be sharing about our Linangan uh, Art Residency. It's my son. Yes. <laughs> and, oh, hello. Okay. I, um, we, can, we can play the video I sent to okay. the. So you'll know, know, learn more about Linangan. Oh. So then I can speak. Okay. Um, May I just introduce you quickly? 
so, yeah. so that uh, our <laughs> listeners will uh, warm up to you a bit. Uh, Ari Gariba is a painter, and she also organizes and writes. Uh, she's received, received prizes for her works in oil and watercolor, uh, shortlisted for the 2021 Purita Kahlo Prize for Art Criticism. Now, yes, she is uh, in, based in Cavite uh, because she runs the Linangan Art Residency, which is an artist-run space. A residency program focusing on capacity building, concept development, and community engagement. I must say, though, that Rina uh, grew up in a very artistic community uh, with uh, her father also as a painter, and all of the friends I think that you've grown up with are all artists. So um, you're well uh, in this position to actually run the residency. Go ahead, Dina. Please share about the what our tech team puts on your slides, Ali, could you tell us how far is Cavite, where you are, from Manila? It's around uh, three to four hours, depending on the traffic. It's it's um, just 30 minutes to 30, 20 to 30 minutes from Tagaytay. So it's the next town. So yeah. <laughs> Before, you were based in Manila. Um, and now that you're in Cavite, is it a new community for you? Uh, yes. Uh, in Alfonso, we, I, we just really uh, recited, started uh, living in Alfonso about two years, three, three years ago. So the residency is uh, a young residency. And um, we, uh, we were, were still integrating with the community there. And also because of the lockdown, you, you can't really conduct more engaged projects with the community. So it's uh, for now, it's a contained community where we do our own gardening and then we do the river cleanup because we have access to the river from our place. And um, it, it's been, um, we started with just one artist actually last year and then eventually as the lockdown um, measures allowed we got we got in more artists two and then three and then recently we have eight artists now um, some even came from Iloilo two of them and one from Keza uh, one from Antipolo and one locally from Alfonso itself. So we we, we try to prioritize um, us coming from the provinces so that um, we're trying to reach artists that are not, you know, in the, so into the, the art scene, not yet. We look for young artists who are just starting out and um, eager to learn, to be mentored, and to actually be part of a community. Because um, we, our program really um, requires the participants to um, be in a commune. Uh, so they have responsibilities while they are staying in the residency. So um, I'll show you more. Your slides are on. Yes. Um, next slide, please. The, the Liningan is an art school, alternative art school. So um, actually, it's an assertion that artists can um, learn from and from each other. And it doesn't have to be from a formal, like like what um, uh, Mr. Puro Shothaman discussed before, that we're looking into other uh, platforms, venues, and um, ways of art education, or so even collectivist ways. So this is a form, in Linangan, this is what we do. So we, we have mentors from artists who did not finish um, academic studies, or, and also we learn from each other in our group discussion. So yeah. It is focused on defining Philippine art and culture through the residency, the workshops we do, and um, 
complementary educational programs. Next, please. So, um, our curriculum consists of two programs, the Amoyong Mentorship, which is a shorter eight-week program, and the Punlaan Artist Residency, which is a three-month program. So, um, for the Amoyong Mentorship Program, we, we host eight artists each run. So, we have run the Amoyong Program in a year. And then, we have two artists per run for the Punlaan um, which is also uh, which is held two times a year. Next slide, please. Next, next slide. Yes. So the uh, capacity building it has three components: uh, capacity building, um, which is about training the skills through techniques and studio classes. Um, can we go back to the last slide? Um, yes, I, and the art history classes, which is conducted by um, the residents, the resident artists themselves. It's like school again, report, they get to report on um, topics. And then also the, the last part, which is the patikim, wherein we invite uh, two to three established artists to critique the artists, the residents' works at the end of their residency. So the next slide is about concept development. Um, we, uh, every week we have a session, so they, they get to explain or present their works to, the, to, the, to their mentor and to their fellow resident artists for feedback and also to, to help them articulate their ideas. Next slide. Community engagement. So uh, this is an, an integral part of the program and the residents get to work with the people in the area and also with each other. They're, they have a they have um, scheduled tasks uh, that they rotate doing like organic gardening, cooking food for each other, and also the fit and right program. Because we believe that you have, you have to have a holistic um, sense of uh, wellness and also aesthetic. I mean, um, that's how you apply being an artist. Uh, next. Next slide, please. These are shots Patikim um, group exhibit the, with the critics. Um, here, the, pictured here are Dindin Araneta, uh, artist Isabel and Freddy Achilisen. And the artist, the resident artist, Carl Belda, Marika Tolentino, and Emard Cañedo, presenting their works. Next slide. Um, for the Punlaan Artist Residency, this is the longer residency program, which is uh, more uh, focused on artists producing and further developing the ideas into a full exhibit, solo exhibit. So this is a three-month program in Amadeo, Cavite. Actually, um, the pro our programs evolved with the spaces that we have. So we, in we incorporated the programs into the studios we, we have developed. Next, please. Here's Jonathan Madeja and his solo exhibit, Baktais. Jonathan Madeja is from Gromblon. Next. This is Roger Mon with this Belfourville exhibit. Roger Mon is from Mandaluyong. Next. Um, here are the alumni of the program, this, which just started 2018. And then the, the earliest artists, 2018, 2019, and then the 2020 started with Noel Elecana from Iloilo. And he, these are 
next piece, these are the alumni of the program so far since 2018 up to this year. Next piece. Okay, next slide. Our, our current batch is Batch Balangao, which started just September and will end November 2. So here are our current um, residents, Freddy Vicente, Hannah Nantes, Roland Llarena, Lutian Kagubatan, Ian Inoy, and Marco Blas. Next. Okay, and we also have um, educational art series to, to that we share online and also to the public as the measures allow, which is the Paxible Art Workshop, on, online art talks, and Cafe Muna. Next slides. Yes, yeah, so the work, workshops we just share with to, to, to hobbyists or um, starting um, artists so that we cultivate the, in, their interest in the arts. So we have a cyanotype workshop, painting workshop, macrame workshop. Next. Uh, we also have online art talks where we invite um, prominent art uh, figures in contemporary Philippine art scene. So, so that they can also share what they do. They can also teach. Uh, we're expanding our platform for so they can share knowledge on their project. Um, next. And Cape Muna is more of a informal discussions about contemporary Philippine art, culture, and aesthetics. We have um, weekly topics, uh, weekly, semi-monthly semi topics for Cape Muna. Next. Okay. Okay, yeah. We're Definitely we'll be it. following you. Thank you, Ali. Yeah. I, I can feel that there will be questions. Yes. Yeah, I mean just to answer the survival part. I, mm. I think to, to for us it's about evolving because we used to do events and but with the events we did like arts festivals and um exhibits talks. Um we it had to evolve because of the situation as well as we have to refine our focus so um flexibility to adjust to the situation as well as to refine our vision what do we really want to do so we realize we're all about we want to educate or through arts or to educate about art education so we refined and refined and then we realized that it is artists that we um, we want to first and foremost educate because it's the artists that make the impact. I mean, because before we were focused on the public through the arts festivals we did. So it's kind of the impact is maybe to a, a lot of people can join the festivals and the events, but the impact itself, I think it's still the artists that really responded to what we did. So it, we decided to focus on that through the residencies. So focusing on that on the vision and also openness as to how the this vision will be realized and we had um supporters along the way that enabled this program to to thrive <laughs> yes okay i'm sure our uh, listeners will want to ask questions who are these supporters and how you see the sustainability of this uh uh, entire residency that just kind of blew up in a year, you know? Uh, but we'll <laughs> definitely uh, discuss more later. And thank you, Ali, for that presentation. I'd like to call on our next uh, presenter, Mars Edwinson Riones. Hi, Mars. Hello, good morning. Quick... Good morning. Where are you calling us from? Uh, I'm joining you from, uh, from Palo, which is in Leyte Island. Uh, it's okay. it's next to urban city. Great. We're probably closer to each other since I am from uh, Negros Island in Dumaguete City. 
than people in Manila. Wonderful. I can feel the aura here uh, coming from you. May I introduce you uh, first before you present your slides? Uh, Marsh is an assistant professor in the Division of Humanities at UP Visayas Tacloban College. He completed his master's in art studies, majoring in art history at the UP Didiman in July 2020, so that was just last year. He serves as the faculty in charge of UP Tacloban's Office of Continuing Education and curated exhibitions by the college's later Samar Heritage Center. He is one of the regional curators of the exhibition currently happening at the moment, uh, the 16th iteration of Viva XCon, entitled Kalibutan, The World in Mind, which opened in September, just uh, month, uh, two or three weeks ago. Okay, Mark. Go ahead. Uh, so let's move to the next slide there. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, um, the the 16th iteration of Viva XCon would, would mark a milestone. It, it was to be the 30th anniversary. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, so much was uh, in the works, in, in the planning and all that. And I was a little uh, excited. I, I was excited for the most part, but I was also a little anxious and uh, awkward because, like I mentioned, it was going to be my first time, to be honest, uh, to join uh, Viva XCon. And uh, we met uh, with the curatorial team in December uh, 2019 in Bacolod City to discuss the curatorial vision and the process of selecting, selecting the artists, uh, among other things. And uh, yeah, uh, COVID happened, and in the next three months, quarantines were implemented in, in the country and the uncertainties and precarities brought about by the pandemic have um, created problems uh, or conditions that uh, Viva has had to grapple with and in some cases uh, tap into. Uh, that is to say, uh, find ways through which challenges could, be, uh, could become opportunities. Uh, obviously, it is the volatility and, and uh, the, the pandemic situation that's been the source of, of most problems and challenges in Viva and in most other endeavors in general. Uh, as we know, life has been at the mercy of uh, the unpredictable implementation and extension of lockdowns and, and travel restrictions, uh, the fear of contracting uh, COVID or infecting a loved one, a friend or, or someone who is more vulnerable and uh, other sorts of emergency. Uh, all these uncertainties not only haunted Viva, but in most cases uh, became the basis for how uh, the event and the exhibition were planned and then have been eventually uh, played out. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. I should have presented these uh, a while ago. Uh, next slide. Um, this is the curatorial team. And in this photo, uh, Dr. Patrick Flores is the one, the sixth from the left. Um, next slide. So uh, one aspect uh, about which I'd like to talk about uh, the challenges and opportunities uh, has to do with uh, selecting artists for the Kalibutan exhibition. Um, my selection of artists for the exhibition, for, for example, did not happen as planned. Uh, because there was a, a perceived need to search for artists and ideas outside centers like uh, the regional capital of Tacloban, before the pandemic, part of my plan to select artists was hoping to cover as much of the region to actually travel to cities and towns in Eastern Visayas. But of course, this was to become a logistical uh, problem when the quarantine started limiting people's mobility uh, between towns. My research and selection process, uh, therefore, largely involved combing through social media and the internet, asking colleagues and forwarding the Viva XCon PubMat and open call to artists that I know. Uh, it was challenging to do, to do it this way because I feel like there is something unique to the rapport that you uh, get to build from speaking with artists or people in general uh, face to face. And with searching for artists virtually, there's also the other issue you have to face, which is 
not all artists have had as much um, or as strong an online presence as others. Therefore, although obvious, it is worth noting that there hasn't been a single uniform method in researching and selecting the artists. Uh, some of them submitted to the open call. One artist was recommended to me. Others I got to speak with either in person through phone calls, messenger, or a combination of, of these. Um, the other aspect uh, that has to do with uh, challenges and opportunities, uh, next slide, um, is uh, the idea of curation as collaborative. Uh, so this is the other theme I'd like to talk about um, in, in terms of the challenges I encountered in my work uh, with Viva. By, by the word itself, I am often reminded that collaboration involves the laboring together of, of various people with various and sometimes overlapping uh, roles and forms of agency, say as artist, curator, uh, and audience. Through my experience in, in Viva, I have been reflecting upon whether these agencies are being rethought or, or re-described, and, and if so, in what ways. Uh, in one of the previous Viva conferences we had earlier this year, because uh, as hinted at uh, a while ago, Viva became incremental, uh, sort of incremental. And so we would have a series of, of conferences that spanned a year. So in one of, of those conferences, I shared my assessment of the art world and its production in my locality. I said that it could probably benefit from more circulation of ideas, objects, practices, individuals, and roles within the art and culture scene and what is deemed outside it. Uh, I said that I was, and, and still am, looking forward to seeing more collaboration among various people to possibly transform the structure that is the art world. I mean, who knows uh, what could emerge from a collaboration between, uh, say, a visual artist, a cartographer, and an activist. Um, I particularly pointed out that I'm interested in turning the art world from a cosmos into a Kalibutan, which is the title of the exhibition. Kalibutan comes from the Visayan word libot, which literally means turn. So I'm interested in turning the art world from a cosmos, at least thinking about how to turn it uh, from a cosmos into a Kalibutan with its shifts, uh, turns, and, and slippages. Um, however, in, in the thick of a pandemic, when most communication and, and social interactions happen remotely, I'm not sure whether collaboration among individuals with various backgrounds is being made more or less possible. I mean, for example, face-to-face uh, -face interactions outside one's existing social circle may be impractical or, or even dangerous because uh, our social bubbles are permeable and in a pandemic, we have to guard it more vigilantly. And, and if you have a social circle of people whose interests, skills, and, and views are broadly akin to your own, maybe say because you work in the same place, then that could be limiting opportunities to collaborate with others. Uh, in the case of uh, Popo Amasqual's project, uh, Amasqual is one of the artists I'm, I'm working with. She originally proposed to interact with healthcare workers and do some sort of ethnographic work in hospitals. But this turned out to be logistically impractical given the protocols. Um, I mean, this example might be extreme because for sure in a pandemic, this would be a very high risk methodology. And then also one could say that remote or, or virtual communication is there. And that's why, for instance, we are here in this uh, webinar room. But for other people uh, who are still not, not coming to terms with communicating online or are struggling to communicate through virtual platforms, and there are those people, um, how much agency do they really have in, in the more collaborative and expansive art world that I was initially thinking of? Uh, these are just musings and questions to which I have no clear answer, uh, but which I feel must be part of uh, ref reflecting on the curatorial process in a time that has become more and more dependent upon virtual space as a site of exhibition making and, and engagement. Uh, next slide. I also thought about um, the relations between the collaborative and the curatorial through the idea of caring. Uh, 
etymologically, uh, curation from the Latin curatus means care. And caring in a way is an act of laboring together. Uh, by this, I, I regard curation as an act of caring for ideas. Um, for example, in, in our correspondences, I and the artists have been taking care of ideas from their germination, from the artist's imagination to their development and uh, recalibration through the different phases of, of the project and through the changing circumstances of, of the last uh, months and even the last year. So for this, uh, the virtual mode provided an opportunity in the sense that our conversations, uh, chats and email threads became archives that record the development of ideas. And it was crucial to keep track um, of conceptual developments because of the very elusiveness and uh, volatility of ideas vis-a-vis -vis the concreteness um, and materiality of, of objects and face-to-face -face interactions. So throughout our correspondences, uh, caring for ideas also came in the form of research and the shared responsibility of exploring concepts and perspectives related to the artist's works. Uh, for instance, I would suggest readings or articles to them or propose to have reading sessions and, and exchange notes. Uh, the last theme I'd like to talk about is, uh, I'd like to uh, draw attention to the title of the exhibition, uh, next slide, which is Kalibutan, uh, The World in Mind. So I'm thinking of a possible shift from Kalibutan as a trope or, or concept uh, to an actual method um, as the head curator unpacked uh, Kalibutan, um, it, it has a particular nuance in that it points to both world and consciousness. That's why the subtitle is the world in mind. In the Visayan language, that's how the world is imagined. It's both um, world and, and, and consciousness. So in this perspective, the, word, the world is an ecology, uh, a set of processes and energies, and not simply a fixed inert place. Um, the world takes place in, in the sense that it happens or, or comes around through reciprocal forces. As uh, Flores mentioned, the world is embodied on the one hand and the body is enworlded on the other. Uh, thus, my response to, to the curatorial vision of Kalibutan has been this rethinking of the word more in terms of uh, processes than as place. Um, just very quickly, uh, I'd also like to mention a Warai proverb, uh, next slide. Warai is the name of the language, the name of my mother tongue, uh, a language spoken in many parts of Eastern Visayas. So in one Warai proverb, uh, the world is imagined not only as geographic, but choreographic. Ankalibutan dalunutan, which is translated in this book as the world is full of slippery turns. Indeed, while Kalibutan may refer to surrounding and then thus uh, the consciousness of existence, of being in the world and being surrounded by it, it also refers to the motion and trajectory of, of turns. Kalibutan as a noun translates to turnedness or the condition of turning. In the more literal sense of the proverb, the world is reckoned as a wet surface. Uh, next slide. And then this may make sense in the context of a group of islands which has had a history of violent storm surges from the recent 2013 super typhoon Haiyan uh, to way back in the time of the 17th century Jesuit priest stationed in, in Leyden summer, uh, Francisco Ignacio Alcina, who said that in Leyden summer, quote unquote, tall mountains of water which form devastating waves enter extent areas of the land. Uh, on an interpretive level, the proverb is a particular articulation of, of resonant tropes concerning fate, gulong ng palad, wheel of fortune, twist of fate, turn of events, turning the tide. Uh, permanence and predictability are frustrated by the very circuitousness of circumstances. So aside from the circulation of ideas and roles, the exchanges and reciprocal sympathies, entailed by collaboration and, and caring. This idea of libot uh, signifying volatility, unpredictability, and slippery turns may be engaged to think about ways of curating that develops the sense uh, of living with contingency. Thank you, Mars, for the very poetic uh, 
description of your practice as a curator. I take it that uh, to survive as curator for Viva, you had to um, dance with the terms of fate, no? Yes. Instead of direct, <laughs> which we think usually curators would do. And um, yes, I hear you as the others have also mentioned that uh, creative practice could probably be resumed in a simple act. And you mentioned the act of caring. Uh, and I think everybody has said the act of sharing, uh, a way of sharing your research, your uh, each other's archives between you and your artists, and perhaps sharing our consciousness of uh, wherever your artists and you um, are situated at this time. Thank you, Martha, again for that uh, wonderful presentation. I call on uh, our participants to send in their questions uh, by on the chat group so that we can keep track of those. Sire is here with yeah. us to yeah. start off part two of our session on the topic, art, culture, COVID, the pandemic survival stories of our neighbors in Southeast Asia. Sire Ryu Pai Pu. Yes, Sire Ryu Pai Pu, yes. Is a performer, interpreter, performing arts manager, Producer. Her past works include her position as a program officer at the Japan Foundation of Bangkok in 2016 to 2019. She is a co producer for Life Performance the Festival in 2019 to 2020. And she translates, manages, coordinates for other projects. She is currently working as the assistant artistic director for EI. PAM, IPAM, Bangkok International Performing Arts Meeting, and one of the core creative producers for Prayun for Art, while pursuing her master's in arts and culture management at UFANA University. IPAM is uh, the uh, platform for regional and international exchange and meeting. And let us welcome, I'd like us to welcome our speaker, Sire. Thank you for the introduction, Sandra. Okay, so just let me quickly share my screen. Hello again, I am Siri Ryu Pai Boon, and thank you so much for the introduction. And today I'm very honored to be a part of the Answer Lab to um, share our experiences in BIPAM um, during this hectic time since um, I believe 2020. Um, so yes, let me just start my presentation. Um, okay, so, oh, here it is. So um, th thank you for the, the introduction. Um, just to, um, again, repeat um, what BIPAM is for, um, you know, some of you who may have not been familiar what BIPAM is. So BIPAM is short for Bangkok International Performing Arts Meeting. And uh, we are an international performing arts platform founded in 2017, which organizes an annual five-day meeting consisting of showcases, um, talk panels, and um, networking activities, and also workshops. And um, by platform, um, our definition of this platform is, is a, a meeting point, um, whether it is you know, in an online or a physical space. Um, and we would like to act as a common ground for professionals in the performing arts fields um, where we can connect, um, showcase our works and create conversations that will nurture the community in um, Thailand and in Southeast Asia and beyond. And I think this is a really kind of like the spine that always kept um, us um, on the track of what we want to do um, during these all uncertainty um, and certain times. So just to give you a little bit of like, you know, some pictures of how it had been when we were able to, to create um, the event in a physical space. So this is like in 2018. And, you know, um, the times where we can talk and see our whole bodies, not just our faces on the screen and um, live performances, of course. Um, 
Okay, so maybe I'm just gonna play like a you know one and a half minute of um, a video presentation about. I think this is in 2019, so you can kind of get the atmosphere or the environment that you really try to nurture um, in the performing arts community. <laughs> อยากให้มาเจอกันเจอกันแล้วสิ่งที่จะได้ก็คือความคิดของเราที่มันอยู่นิ่งๆมันจะเกิดการเคลื่อนไหวเกิดการแลกเปลี่ยนยิ่งคุยกับคนแตกต่างหลากหลายเท่าไหร่ยิ่งดีแล้วใบแพมก็เป็นพื้นที่ให้สิ่งนี้เกิดขึ้นมาเจอกันค่ะมาคุยกันเยอะๆแล้วคิดกันเยอะๆมาเจอกันเจอกันแล้วเนี่ยมันจะเกิดการเคลื่อนไหวเกิดการเปลี่ยนแปลงในสังคม So to prepare, um, you know, everything from October to 2019 for uh, March of 2020 is a little bit um, too tight for us. So we decided, okay, we're gonna have a break for one year to really kind of uh, prepare and think about what we want for our next annual meeting. And then, of course, um, for the case of Thailand, um, COVID had hit. Um, first time, I believe it was in um, middle, uh, late March, um, that we had to stop all activities that are in physical spaces, in theaters, and then we went into lockdown. Um, and so I think at that point, it was a really kind of um, a strange time for everybody globally. And um, we were on our path to think of um, ideas for the next meeting. And when the pandemic hit, um, I think we had, um, you know, uh, a lot of inspirations. But really, to wanting to touch base with our friends and neighbors in Southeast Asia. And another thing, it was. Because although we always try to say that we want to be a platform for Southeast Asia, we know how vast and diverse, you know, the region is, even in one country or, or you know, with all the 11 countries. So um, at that point, um, in like middle of 2020, we wanted to really reach out to the people who we have not met before, and really touch base. And you know, see how they are within this situation. So we created um, this under the sea webinar. Um, in I, I believe we started out in uh, August, July, August, um, and it's a series of webinars that um, that went on for 11 weeks. So we had um, one country, um, three to four speakers from one country per week. And then we touched on all 11 countries in Southeast Asia, 
Um, and the meaning behind um, this name is also, I think it's, it's an interesting take because, um, you know, being a country in Southeast Asia, um, I think we all know that the issues and problems of the pandemic of COVID-19 is not just the same as any part of the world. I think our issues that we deal with COVID-19 in our society um, of, of Southeast Asia, it's kind of twofold. It's, and especially when you're um, working in the arts and culture field. Um, at that point, we got a lot of surveys from you know, um, organizations to really um, ask us about um, how we were um, in, in the arts and culture sector. And we found out that um, the problems that we had you know, in terms of like infrastructure and resources were already there um, even before the COVID-19. So, so in a sense, this um, pandemic really kind of, um, you know, removed, lift the rug to really see what problems lies under. And I think there was a kind of like a word play for, you know, under the sea, sea meaning like Southeast Asia as well what has the, the pandemic revealed um, about our situations um, in the performing arts community. Um, and it was such a really um, wonderful um, experience for us as the organizers as well, because, um, you know, when we say that we curated um, speakers from 11 countries, um, we were really aware of not just um, talking on, like a surface level of trying to kind of have everybody representing a nation state because that is impossible anyways. So, so our take and our approach in curating this webinar is to really kind of having, trying to reach out for a human connection and talk about the personal stories and creative trajectory of, of the people we've invited and then try to make sense in each person's environment and um, country's context. Um, and, you know, we had questions about um, their artistic inspirations, um, their dreams and their um, issues that they're facing or something like that. So it's not just, okay, how is your country? But it's, it's more of like, how is your life? And then um, to add on to that webinar, we also um, curated you know, digital works of uh, the artists or producers um, that we have invited and um, you know, uh, put this all of this in our online platform. So um, this is in 2020. And, and after um, having the Under the Sea webinar, um, we were really inspired um, and had a lot of um, thoughts for our 2021 annual meeting because we, we had uh, more conversations with our existing friends than we all as well. But then the issue is, of course, you know, we thought after the first wave or, or the second wave in some countries, when it had gone, it, it would be over, but no, it, it's not over. And, and then there's all of these uncertainty because sometimes it gets better, but then it gets worse. So for us thinking about 2021, I think we have these two big issues on our hands. So first of all, of course, is the situation, the uncertainty of the situation and specifically in, in Thailand as well is of course, we still have the pandemic. Um, and sometimes you don't know if you can kind of push for like, you know, a physical event or you still have to um, do something online. So that's very uncertain. And of course, in, in Thailand, there's also a lot of political turmoil. Um, again, um, I think this is also the case for a lot of countries in our region as well is that um, the pandemic really triggered a lot of the existing problems we have within our um, you know, socio-political context. And sometimes it's really hard to push um, you know, uh, an art and culture event when you have your friends on the streets 
or sometimes you have your friends arrested or something like that. So it's, it's a really kind of um, uh, a situation that we really have to, to put ourselves out and really think in the fabric of what's going on in the world. Um, and then on the other hand, we have this really kind of beautiful theme that um, our artistic director, Sasa Pin Sariwanej, and um, our artistic board had came up, which is this theme of ownership. And the inspiration came from a performance that we saw um, in, in, in Israel. It's about, um, you know, owning um, about your abilities and disabilities and, and really having a beautiful take on it. But unfortunately, we could not um, contact them to, to our um, annual meeting. But again, we still really want to keep the theme of ownership because it's still very, um, I think it's really, it, it talks to, on a lot of levels and it's really um, relevant to, to so many things. So again, when, when we have these two things on our hands, for us, I think what we have to really think about is to produce something that's practical and relevant to the performing arts community, community. And then also keeping in mind that the performing arts community is still in the fabric of a wider community in our country, in our region. So um, next, I'm, I'm just gonna really touch really briefly about the theme ownership because um, the thing that we have developed within our the circumstances is that um, you know we 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 know that right now what kind of situation we are in and uh, we kind of interpret it in terms of like giving the empowerment to to our audiences and our people and the the, the working people in the arts and culture field um, so so by interpreting this theme of ownership, um, we really can have different conversations about the empowerment and what we own, even though it's, it's kind of going um, against all the streams of, of um, things that are happening. So we can own our history, our body, um, our legality, political status, or, or gender, you know, so many um, levels um, in, in, our, in this multifaceted Southeast Asian context. So this um, uh, artistic choice was made. Um, and in terms of management, um, so I think there are three things that we had made a decision. So first of all, it's actually making the decision. So, so we thought we would have it in March, but because of the uncertainty of the situation and how we want to reconstruct our, our meetings, we moved it to, again, um, later in the year, which is uh, the 1st to the 5th of September, um, actually last month um, that had happened. And we decided to, although we are at an international um, meeting, we want to cut all of international invitations. So it's, it doesn't mean that um, we won't be working with um, uh, international artists, but it's just we're not gonna fly them in because that will be too much of something that we can control. Um, and at first we thought we would kind of try to do a hybrid, you know, um, uh, in the physical space for the local audiences and then online for international audiences. But in the end, I think we had to really think for the worst case scenario and just rip off the, the bandaid and just, okay, we're just gonna go online. Um, and, and then uh, I'm just gonna jump to, to the third point because it's, it's kind of connecting to um, the decision that we made. So when we made a decision that it's going to be online, of course, it's a bummer because we're, we're a performing arts platform. You know, we, we really wanted to have live performances and we know how important it is. But then again, um, there are opportunities that we can really think about if we commit to the situation. And, um, you know, and I, I will touch on this and give you an example in a, in a few slides. Um, and again, in terms of like restructuring the activity, we know that we have a lot of, um, you know, dense program for the five-day event. 
And because of this uncertainty, uh, we decided to reprioritize and really think in details of what each activity is answering to what target. So um, there would be workshops, there would be networking activities and stuff like that. So we try to kind of like expand it and not have it, you know, jammed up in a five day event so that we can kind of um, have a little room to, to stand by for whatever would be, you know, the, 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 the worst case that can happen. Okay, I have only three minutes left, so I'm gonna go really fast. Okay, so this is one of the examples that we have expanded uh, the, the activity. So this is the workshop. And we know that most of the time the workshops answer to our local um, artists and local audiences. So uh, we decided to not make it in the five day event in September and have it in uh, earlier in the year. And this is also, um, in tune with the theme, which is ownership, um, ownership, literally um, intellectual property of the artist. And then also uh, working in terms of like ownership of the voices of, of artists in our community, um, which is this uh, performing arts lab for tomorrow, is um, having them uh, having discussions with stakeholders of the performing arts community in, in Thailand. And next, so this is uh, um, our, networking event so we also um uh took it out of the five-day event and create this really um kind of a matchmaking and um a, a panel that we get artists local artists uh to uh, meet with uh tech technical and science startups collectives and really try to think of the possibilities of how we can work together and so this is an example of what I mean in terms of finding the possibilities of committing to the online or the virtual space. So this project called Deleted Scenes in Southeast Asia uh, is a collaboration with, between us and IDRF, Indonesian Dramatic Reading Festival. We curated three um, plays, scenes from three plays that are banned um in in their respective countries and we thought if this an, if it is in a virtual space nobody can do anything to us i think um so so we tried to you know pick three three scenes from three band plays and you know translate it and switch um directors and actors from another country try to do it in another language and really see the meaning behind of why it is censored why it why it is banned um, what does it mean if uh, we do it in another context or something like that? And um, lastly, so this is another one that we really, really committed to this kind of like virtual and online space. So we always worked with Google Docs, right? So this is um, a performance on Google Docs. So we, it's a participative performance as well. So we had um, two artists talking about their work and allowing the audiences to watch the work and have a live conversation on Google Doc with um, the artists. And uh, last but not least, we were talking about really connecting and you know, um, having solidarity within uh, these hardship times. So we, this is the talk panel where we curated um, three young artists, activists in Thailand to have a conversation with a, a more experienced um, artist slash activist of Southeast Asia um, uh, from the Philippines, from Bur uh, Myanmar, and then from Malaysia. And then we really kind of try to um, talk about the strategies and really having hope for a brighter future in our respective countries. Last but not least, we had um, uh, a special event. Um, so this is the People's Revolution um, is uh, an NFT art project that uh, to fundraise for the People's Democratic Movements in Myanmar. This is also one of our um, events, opening events. And then we revived um, the Under the Sea alumni to give out video messages to really kind of catch up what there are 
doing how they are doing in 2021 and created like a video series out of it. So um, to finish and um, uh, kind of summarize, conclude everything, I think um, our survival lesson um, through these two years of trying to make sense and, and curate um, what is relevant to us and, and our function is that I think um, sometimes when everything is really hectic, we can take this time of uncertainty to really reevaluate um, our role as a platform. So, so that we had numerous of meetings to really prioritize um, what we can do and what we should do. And not just for the sake of the situation as well, but for the sustainability of, of us. Because if we're thinking we're doing something that's really passionate and really meaningful, we would want to do it in the long run, right? Um, and then the next one is really about connecting on a human level. So again, um, I always say, or we always say that we want to be this kind of platform for the Southeast Asian region and, and really um, connecting to various countries. But at the end of the day, it's really about the personal stories that we want to connect to and then how those personal stories can lead up to um, the regional network. And sometimes you really have to not overproduce, but really give time to, to incubate and develop that process and connection. And um, last but not least, um, I think it's, it's sad to say, but you know, the online format is, is here to stay, I think. But, um, for me, I, I, I cannot deny that the physical mobility is still very necessary. We still need to see each other. We need to, and, and especially when on like first encounters, it's really um, relevant. And, and especially for, for as, as an opportunity for the artists and the practitioners in the community as well, sometimes we cannot afford to just work in an online environment is about accessibility and it's about opportunity for, for um, the community as well. So just really think about what would be best um, in terms of the functionality. Um, yeah, Thank that's you. all. Yep. <laughs> I, I just had to let you speak because uh, you definitely touched a good point about um, accepting loss, the possibility of loss of just saying no at this time of crisis. Uh, I also held back uh, two interesting or new uh, sharings that uh, could be an idea of how to survive is to uh, accept hybridity. It's interesting that your, um, your, you had a partnership with uh, technology, uh, digital creatives which uh, is one way to survive, especially for the performing arts that was so uh, perhaps disconnected with online practice before the, the pandemic. And then also interestingly that you took the chance to um, talk about what you wouldn't normally or usually show if we were able to see each other uh, physically, but online you could get away with. Yeah. Oh, wait, was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Sorry, sorry for, for talking over time. Yeah, but yeah, thank well, you so much. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, we will have, I'm sure, another time to talk in length about your projects and questions and questions can be posted on the chat group for our participants. Thank you again, Siri. I'd like to call on uh, Siri. <laughs> I'd like to call on uh, Pacian Lo and uh, Junyi Ma, friends from uh, Malaysia, who are arts managers, caretakers. Uh, Hello. Hello. You are in Kuala Lumpur, is that right? Yes, yes correct. We're zooming in from Kongsi KL. Wonderful. Um, may I introduce first uh, Pei Sien Lo? Yep. Pei Sien, you are a manager of uh, Kongsi Kuala Lumpur since 2018, and you have been an assistant producer of Seni Tiga since 2019. 
You're a freelance photographer, a filmmaker, and graphic designer. You have been an active contributor in various local film festivals, film productions, and community-focused initiatives. In 2019, you participated in the Koganecho Bazaar, Artists in Residence Manager Internship in Residence Program. And you recently curated the Situ, an uh, exhibition under the Curatorial Workshop 2020 organized by the Japan Foundation in Kuala Lumpur. Whereas Juni Ma is the manager of Kong CKL since 2019, so a year after DCF, I suppose. Also assistant producer of Senitiga. You work in a curatorial team of Lost Gens as an architectural designer. Um, Jun Yi has set up various museums and galleries and has also co-curated the Pankor Story House in 2019 with her team from the UCSI University. Her other involvements include Malayan Mansion Research Project supported by Kazana and Think City, Tokyo Performing Arts Meetings, and Asian Performing Arts Farm organized by Tokyo Festival. She is a producer, lecturer, architectural designer, and writer. Go ahead, Paysian and Junyi. We'd like to hear from you. Thank you, Sandra. I will now share my screen. Are you able to see? Okay, so, uh, right. So my name is Junyi and this is Paysian. We are in, this is for us to show face. <laughs> and uh, we are currently in Gongsi KL. As you can see, this is a warehouse, pretty big. It's almost 10,000 square feet. And from a bird's eye view, it is, um, it looks like this. It's situated inside of an industrial compound on Jalan Klang Lama, which is Old Klang Road. This road that cuts diagonally uh, at the top of the picture, linking the city center on the right to Port Klang on the left. So um, for those of you who are not so familiar with uh, the geography of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur is situated on the peninsula, the west side of the peninsula. And we are about seven kilometers away from the city center. So um, the Klang River and the Old Klang Road actually were the main arteries of the city for close to 200 years. Um, so we're, we're here in the middle of Old Klang Road. And there are a lot of industrial compounds in the past few decades. And slowly it became a, a residential area as well as office buildings and commercial buildings. So we are a little bit different from a lot of the art space in Malaysia because uh, we do not pay rent. <laughs> we, uh, our founders actually spoke to the landowner and the landowner, which is a developer in Kuala Lumpur, and trusted the space to this group of founders who is uh, consisting academics, architects, designers, as well as artists. And they were running the space in 2017. This picture were, was taken in the space in 2017 was when um, everything was lacking. There was no running water. There was no electricity, no lighting system, no nothing. So obviously there is also not uh, started by a manager. So it was a very organic space and very temporary because the uh, deal that we have with the developer was that we have the space to run artistic and cultural projects and activities until they find the suitable time to develop the entire land. So the name Gongsi KL actually means, uh, has two components. Gongsi means sharing in both Bahasa Malaysia as well as uh, assembly or company in various Chinese dialects. So KL is not just Kuala Lumpur, it also means Kilang Lama, which is old warehouse in Bahasa Malaysia, as well as Klang Lama, the name of our neighborhood and Kuala Lumpur, our name of the, our city. So we knew since the beginning that the space has to be very multi-purpose and very neutral because of the nature of 
how it started. So we wanted this space to be a playground for people with ideas or uh, with the ability to imagine different possibility to come in to share different things, uh, different resources to make something bigger together. So in 2017, the group of founders actually curated a few events on themselves, including Dances in Ruins, which is a dance video and a performance done on site, and a group exhibition involving university students, artists, and designers. So that was what happened in 2017. We were just testing to see how things are and, oh, really in progress. and to see if we could get um, even more people to be interested to, to build this space together. And in 2018, we had our first manager of GoSikiel, her name is Doris, and she knew that with her, with the effort and time of herself, it was almost impossible for her to run something meaningful. So she invited even more people from different disciplines to build this space together under the initiative called Gongsi Collab. So there is this army of different uh, people, including performance maker, uh, people who run events, f and operators, uh, people who collect secondhand furniture and people who plant, play with plants and uh, food. So it was quite a fun year because we created a lot of activities and events together. And then apart from that, we are also actively building local communities by uh, running workshops and classes. And a lot of students from different institutions actually kind of like to have their graduation show over here uh, because of the vast volume as well as the low rental. Uh, okay, so um, also this is to explain that we do not receive any support from any corporates. Um, so we are basically running events and renting the venue to different people so that we could generate some income to pay for utilities and for our salaries. So uh, we rent our space out for different people to sometimes shoot, sometimes events, sometimes performances. And we happen to attract a lot of university students from especially architecture students as well as some performing arts students over the years. So apart from that, we're also starting to build relationship with international artists. The first international artist group who came to Gong si Kiel was THE Dance Company from Singapore. They came twice, once in 2018 and once in 2019. And in 2020, uh, Shui from Taiwan came over and we brought him around and he, uh, when, we, when we have visitors from other countries, we try to program different activities so that these people could have an exchange or beca become an inspiration uh, with the among our local communities. So we try to have that kind of exchange when we have visitors. And in 2019, that was when Doris left and I joined. Heisen is has been here since the beginning. So together we produced Sunny Tiga with another uh, volunteer advisor who is also part of the uh, founders uh, group. So we, we, we created Sunny Tiga, which is a multidisciplinary performance series. Um, we invited artists to create, to create shows in the warehouse. And then uh, that year itself, we managed to bring three shows to two different festivals in Malaysia. So it was also a very, very fun year. And then when that happened, a lot of people see even more possibilities of the space. And that is when people start to take, a, take an interest in, you know, realizing the nature of the space that, you know, it, it's a very durable structure and it has all these different, um, different texture that a uh, usual black box or a pro professional performing art space wouldn't have. So people were having fire in the space, putting, putting, installing sprinklers so that to create this rain, and then people are making cloud and uh, different performance performing groups are also in the space to test things out. So that was what happened in 2019. And in 2020 to 2021, uh, pandemic happened, we actually were planning to run Sunny Tiger 
throughout the year. But um, when this happened, we were one month away from our first show of 2020. But the pandemic obviously shake things up a little, no, a lot. And uh, we had a political power shift twice throughout this entire period in Malaysia and very confusing laws and guidelines from the government. From this table, you would be able to tell there's different names. MCO is the movement control order and the creative industry was heavily, severely impacted. So, um, but it doesn't mean that we stop doing things. Uh, maybe Pisen could take over this session and tell us, tell, tell our friends here what we were doing during that time. So in the beginning of the pandemic last year, March, um, I started to realize um, because of all the works and activities in Gongsi KL has stopped and I realized that I needed a space for myself um, to, to sort of to have a conversation with myself. So I decided to do a lockdown in Gongsi KL. Um, but actually, I'm not the first one who were saying in this warehouse, this empty warehouse, um, there were two artists before me, uh, Chihai and Amiru. Um, but the reason of doing this is because after attending the internship in Koganecho and also uh, went to the Bee Paradise, uh, uh, I realized that residency could also be a way to support the artist and I decided to try it out myself. So during the two months in Gongsi Kiao, uh, I moved my home here. I live and eat here. And also I created some work, uh, mostly photography based. And in this uh, period of time, I, I thought um, solitude was a good, uh, I would be medicine for myself um, to to adapt to this pandemic, yeah. And then there comes more questions as we all have more times to reflect uh, as um, an art manager or as a person who is running a space or as uh, ourselves as an individual, what uh, is meaningful to us, yeah. Yeah, actually these questions are uh, long overdue. We felt that we were just too distracted to address all these concerns and doubts when there was no pandemic and the pandemic merely revealed all this to us and uh, we find ourselves very vulnerable at this time, a difficult time like this. Um, so we started doing a lot of reflections as an organization, as an art space and, and as individuals ourselves. So 2020 became a year for us to take a break and do some reflection and then we reacted to it and uh, in 2021 we started adapting uh, whatever that we've learned from the past year uh, but it's not a one directional process it's a trial and error kind of way to see what works and what doesn't and um, in the pandemic we actually had the opportunity to make new friends from different part of the world we've had different conversations with practitioners and they sort of help us understand what we are doing in the space. So it was, um, I, I feel that all these conversations are quite inspiring to, to us because we're just blindly doing things for such a long period of time. And whenever we have a dialogue with other people, it's like, okay, we take a break to see what we're really doing. So that's what happened. And uh, when the movement control order was lifted briefly for two months last year, we opened our space up to invite artists back into this warehouse to sort of break free because everybody has been confined in our homes for such a long period of time and people need physical interaction, people need space. So we invited them to jam have a jamming session in the in, in our space not just about that we were also making uh, notes observing how we're supposed to respond during a live event so that was what happened uh, but we well one thing we learned from the pandemic was to 
take things slowly, like what patient was doing in the space, taking her time because she needed the time and the, and the space. So uh, we didn't really respond immediately like other performing arts group and spaces. They were releasing shows on uh, different virtual platforms, but we were not able to do that because both of us are not established artists ourselves. We do have some ideas, but we don't have uh, readily available material to be, to, to be able to transition into a different form for presentation. But um, after a, quite a long wait, at the end of 2020, the show that was supposed to happen in April actually transitioned into a film and was presented on Cloud Theatre, which is a virtual, uh, virtual performing space that people are using in Malaysia currently. And uh, Sunny Digger moves on, but we shifted the focus from the product to the process. So right now it's taking a form of a laboratory instead of a performance. And what, we're, what we have to do is just to prepare the platform and invite artists in. And um, well, artists are pretty resilient themselves. So what we have to do is just to sit, sit down and have a look at um, how these people are responding, responding to uh, the change and to find new ways to create, collaborate and present art. So that was what happened this year. And Pacian actually curated another show, DC2. Do you want to talk about that? Um, DC2 actually takes reference from in situ, like site specificity, because we are both like architecture trained. So um, reacting to site is something that uh, I personally really interested in. Um, but uh, mainly it is, the idea is from the reflection of our relationship with the place as, as well as workplace and living place. And also we invited artists to reflect upon that during the exhibition. So what happened was it was supposed to be a live event with uh, various activities. We even, uh, Taysian even commissioned two artists to create two artworks, one pavilion and one table over here. Uh, to sort of um, conclude the idea of site specific or to express their, their, their ideas on it. And um, we were able to transition this on different platform as a, as a hybrid event. So something are on site and something are online. So, and drawing inspiration from what Kaysian did during the first lockdown, uh, we realized a need for artists to experiment or just a space for them to be with themselves. So we started a space for solitude, inviting artists to take care of the space with us in exchange of this uh, warehouse so that they could try exploring and uh, experiment with their own works. And then uh, Yong Chia came to us, he, uh, he is a visual artist. He, his take on the pandemic was to, uh, it reminded him of uh, an old work that he did in maybe five years ago. And then he installed this in our space and we collaborated with him and created a 48 hour live stream. Uh, I think we can share that link later in the chat box. It was a live streaming of what happens in the space with this artwork in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, for 48 hours and then artists turn up at different time of the day to interact with this artwork. So sometimes during the night, sometimes in the daytime, some people who couldn't make it to the physical space interacted with the art space, uh, with the artwork online. So a lot of possibilities are happening over here. And uh, the volunteer advisor, who is also the producer of Sunny Tiger, she thought that maybe it's time for arts to take a, take a break. So the industry, the creative industry could wait, but um, there are other things that could, um, that could, that she could occupy herself with for that moment. So she started baking and then started selling breads in our neighborhood. And then all the profits are donated to different artists, collectives and art spaces 
uh, in 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 Malaysia. And we also started taking evening walks around Oakland Road. It's called, uh, we gave it a name so that we could post these pictures online <laughs> <laughs> and to make sure ourselves could commit uh, time to do this on a weekly basis. So it's called Jalan Jalan Klang Lama. In English, it's uh, walking along Oakland Road. So this is, this is what happens in our vicinity. So it's actually a very vast spectrum of the upper middle upper upper class to the lower class so there are a lot of different faces and different communities including uh, vulnerable ones like refugees and migrants so um, we got to see that a lot last year when we are not so busy running events so we are really taking our time to do this and someone else actually saw our space as a pop, as a vaccination center so uh, they turned this space into a pop-up uh, vaccination center for the refugees and migrants communities along Oakland Road. And it, well, it, it, it just became one during that day. And then uh, this is what the multi-purpose uh, elements, uh, no, the, the nature of the space of being a multi-purpose uh, or a very neutral space that um, allow this kind of possibilities to happen because we are just two minds over here and the possibilities that we can see is limited but when different people come into the space they they see different things and they and they and we work with this different group of people to create different kind of events sometimes it's not so artistic sometimes it's nothing to do with culture and social so this is what happened and uh, off online off site what we're doing is also talks dialogues with different group of people uh, this is also a response that we have uh, towards what's happening in Malaysia so it's called big world small talk the first episode we invited a stateless Malaysian the series was inspired by this person because they said they have tried various ways to, to get his citizenship, but there was, but he didn't, he, it was just not successful after, 20, after more than 10 years of trying. So now he is trying to reach the art scene so that the creative people could actually raise some awareness because he felt that the uh, people from the arts industry could actually empathize with him and to and they have the skill and language to make this into something bigger than what he himself could do and then we started moving on from that uh, we talked with contract doctors um, this was an issue in Malaysia a few months ago when these doctors were feeling overworked and underpaid like us <laughs> And uh, the, the most recent one is Big World Small Talk number three, where we invited art practitioners to respond to uh, the three-year recovery plan for the creative industry initiated by a cultural development agency. So um, to conclude our experience throughout the two years, we've asked a few questions ourselves. Is art essential? I think we already have that answer. It is essential because it feels like a, it's like opening a window in a home. It's like uh, somebody need this window to get fresh air. Somebody need this window to seek help. And do we really need an art space after seeing so many possibilities that could happen online without a space? The answer is yes, because in a city, in the scale of a city, an art space actually feels like a window uh, in, in a house. It, some, some people really need this space just to take a break. And some people need this window to express different things. And um, it became the reason to enable different things to ferment in the space. And uh, it the pandemic also revealed to us how much we desire physical contact. So we thought this is really important. And uh, on top of all this, what is 
my role as an art manager and a lot of times we don't think we are one because we don't have the formal training to become one and uh, we are not here by choice we are here by chance so there are a lot of things that are out of control and very new to us so to conclude these questions we feel that the art space and the arts manager are the one who bring this table together so that people could put different things on this and even more people could gather around this table to see something happen. So some people may want to share food. Some people may just want to put things uh, hiding in the corner. Maybe it's not even a thing yet, but we, by having that table, we are able to create that sort of time and space for things to take a, take a break and ferment into something else. Uh, some people want to just show a professional setting for them to present their works. That is also one possibility. But what we're doing here is just to give an idea of a table, which is almost non-existent when there is no event around this table. And our job as caretakers in the space, it's actually not just the two of us. There is another friend, Chihai. Um, so a lot of time, we, we, what we do in the space is upkeeping. We do a lot of cleaning, um, maintaining the space. But um, apart from that, we have to do a lot of coordination, documentation, and maintenance. So we didn't really know what we signed up for when we first joined. But um, apart from that, we're all individuals with different ideas and different interests. So. The last question, I would like to end this presentation with the last question that we're still looking for an answer for, uh, which is as a caregiver and caretaker of the space, how do we as art managers find care? Thank you. Thank you, Faith Yenlo and Junima. My goodness, um, this uh, presentation of yours tells us that uh, we can actually tell creative take a break <laughs> and I wish we could right now, but we still have uh, one more presenter, actually two of them together, Paradise Air. And uh, we'll get back to a question and answer with uh, Christian, Junyi and all the rest of the presenters in a while. Koji, Kato, Mei, Miyauchi, are you there? Please welcome Paradise Air. While I introduce Koji and May, I'd like to invite them to already perhaps uh, share screen so that we can move on to their presentation. We have 10 minutes for you, Koji and May. Uh, let's keep it short and sweet so that we can open up the uh, question and answer for everyone mm -hmm. before one o'clock. Uh, Koji is an artist, uh, Paradise Air Coordinator and Director of Studio and Dead End. Uh, she received her Master of Fine Arts from Global Art Practice at Tokyo University of the Arts. Oh, he, he has exhibited his work in shows such as uh, The Distant of the Earth in Tokyo, For Whom We Fight, Kisai, Hiroshima, For Whom We Fight, Gallery G in Hiroshima, and many others. Whereas Mei Miyauchi is a coordinator and curator born 1991 in Japan, member of Paradise Air, which is a collective team running an artist in residence program in Matsudo, Japan. She also works at the Learning Arts Center, Viva. It is an industry government academia collaboration project as a program officer and conducts the citizen program art communic communicator. She graduated from Sukhumiya University, Faculty of Foreign Studies, and is a graduate of Tokyo University of the Arts Graduate School of Global Arts. Please share and let us know what paradise is over in Japan. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, let me share screen. Okay. So um, yeah, thank you very much for introduction. Uh, hello, my name is Koji Kato, uh, who is working as an artist, also one of the coordinator in Paradise Air. Uh, yes, uh, so today I and another coordinator, May, would like to share with you about our activities 
also about how we survive as an art uh, as an uh, artist in residence in Japan. So uh, Paradise Air is an artist in residence located in Matsudo City, Chiba Prefecture, and conveniently close to the central Tokyo. Actually, there is no public art museum in Matsudo City. So uh, in response to this, Matsudo City has begun to create opportunities for local people to come into contact with art closer to their daily lives and other cultural activities, art city for living. Then, <clears throat> then various people started to cooperate for that movement through many events and such efforts. In 2013, Paradise Air was launched in order to create a place where artists can keep living and working here. The residency program is held on the vacant floors of the former hotel, a setting afforded to us by the Lakuen Pachinko Pala that occupies the bottom floors of this building, owned by Hamatomo Corporation. The name Paradise Air is came from the word Lakuen. Actually, it's in English, Paradise. Paradise Air operates under the concept of one stay, one art. Artists can stay for free, but instead, they leave something new. This is actually connected to the spirit of Matsudo tradition as well. Going back to the Edo era, Matsudo was well known as a post town on the Mito Highway, connecting Edo and Mito City. The street lined many hotels and travelers came and stayed there. It is says that there are still works of art in the residences of local people that were left behind by artists who visited in the past in exchange for lodging fees. With this history in mind, we are working to connect Matsudo City with art. Okay, so now uh, that you understand that origins of paradise, so let's see inside. Our residency is located on fourth and fifth floors in a building. Every room are decorated almost exactly as they were, <coughs> sorry, as they were when the hotel was built in 1989. And you can feel the Japan of the bubble era. There are 15 rooms in total, which has two ways to use, artist residency room and the studio for rent by local creators. This is for the artist stay. Each room has 40 square meters wide with a big bus apart from toilet. Also the kitchen and laundry are in shared space. They can stay and work here freely for their activities. This is a management member of Paradise. They are active in various fields, such as photography, art, architecture, translation, performing arts, and so on. It makes very flexible coordinate by bringing together different kinds of skill and perspectives. Now we organize around three programs. The short stay program open not only just to artists, but also to curators or researchers too. The long stay program provides full support for the travel stay and production of artwork for three months for artists selected through an open call. And finally, the land program, which connects to the artist with the city, encouraging different kinds of uh, learning and interaction. Based on their program, since we started, we have invited more than 300 artists from around the world. Paradise Air doesn't force artists to make their artwork during their stay because we accept also activities such as research and experimental things for their next output. This is because artists from all over the world always bring about so many things here. 
we can realize overlook attractiveness of the city through their perspectives. New encounter and alternative communication are given birth every day. But in 2020, suddenly Corona has made it difficult to invite artists from abroad. While residency programs all, all over Japan were temporarily shutting down, then we had to try to think new program that would be open to the public to the extent possible and with a, pos with a positive attitude. Finally, in response to this situation, we launched new program, Matsudo QOL Hour. This is a program only invite artists who live within 60 minutes of Matsudo station and to offer them a special three week experience. The chosen artist is provided funding which can be used for living expenses during the staying at private space and the production time at Paradise Air. By offering this environment separated from home or society, it aims to create the time and space for artists to focus on creation for the future of themselves. QOL means quality of life, but also aims to quarantine of lowly. Even if it's alone, but sometimes it's very important it's very important to think something for creation. Through this program, some artists were invited to spend their time in Matsudo with various motivation. For example, violinists who had fewer opportunities to perform or artists who were unable to return to their home country for a while. During this time, basically, we talked by Zoom and supported by remote. Uh, for example, this artist in this photo is Lau C. Lumbres. Uh, he's an artist from Philippines. He was working on very unique work. It was to make time capsule with the documentary film to post to the future, like after Corona. So uh, we were able to see a lot of positive ideas from their artists under this situation. The QR Award continued this year as well and hosting many artists. If you want to see more details, please check our website later. Okay, but actually this program is only a small part of Paradise Air activities. Okay, so from now, I want to give the microphone to May. Are you ready? Yeah, okay. okay.